Now, it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Roger Scruton. Uh, he's currently research professor uh, at the Institute for Psychological Sciences, where he teaches philosophy uh, at their graduate school in both Washington and in Oxford. Uh, but he's a writer whose oeuvre extends with wit and penetration across an amazing range. Philosophic, artistic, political, cultural, autobiographical. He's the author of more than 30 books and numerous articles. He's written considerably on aesthetics with particular attention to music and architecture. An exemplary is his 2003 book, Death, Devoted Heart, Sex and the Sacred in Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, which is an analysis of the musical and spiritual meaning of Wagner's great work. He engages in contemporary political and cultural debates from the standpoint of a conservative thinker. And most re recently, in 2007, he published Culture Counts, Faith and Healing in a World Besieged. Uh, back in 2001, he published with Intercollegiate Studies Institute Books, a book entitled The West and the Rest, which is an analysis of the values held by the West and how they are distinct from those held by other cultures. And tonight he will enlighten and provoke us with his further thoughts on this last pregnant topic. Mr. Scruton. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to discuss some um, central features of Western civilization today, which uh, are difficult to define uh, and about which I have a few suggestions which might help you to think about what it is, this civilization to which we belong, and um, how and with what weapons we should defend it, and indeed whether it is worthy of our defense. And I, I want to discuss these questions in the context of, uh, first of all, of globalization, which we're all familiar with, although I, I'm sure nobody in, no two people in this room would agree on how it should be defined, and secondly, in the context of terrorism, of the kind that we have witnessed in the world of the past uh, nine or ten years. Now, I think the first thing to, to re remember about globalization is that this is not a new phenomenon. It's not for the first time in the history of mankind that people have been communicating around the world or seeking new contacts or making new relations outside the borders of their own uh, native territory. Uh, on the contrary, this is part of the natural human condition um, and uh, all of us are the, the products of uh, nomadic people of many generations back and um, most people in this room probably have roots outside the country uh, where they now will, uh, find themselves. Now, uh, what is new is not globalization, but globalization without empire. Uh, that is, uh, say, without some central controlling metropolitan power which exerts some form of legal and political order over the entire uh, extent of its uh, influence. Now, we, we are familiar from history with two great empires, the Roman and the British, uh, and um, this country, of course, owes its uh, origins to the British Empire and its present identity to its um, unwise rebellion against that <laughs> particular past. But uh, now uh, we are very different, of course, uh, and uh, it's uh, America rather than Britain that has um, assumed what Kipling called the white man's burden, I say the burden of maintaining uh, a, a, a some kind of presence all around the globe which will have as its primary purpose and primary effect to maintain some kind of legal order and um, predictable uh, form of, uh, of international trade. Now, uh, the great question in everybody's mind is whether it's possible to maintain this position of superiority uh, 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 and use it to uh, enforce some kind of order without empire. This is, of course, what all Americans hope for. No Americans want the world simply to collapse into separate uh, and disorderly uh, little um, 
uh, corners with only America enjoying a rule of law, but also no American really wants to be involved in imposing uh, the legal order outside the borders of this country. And this is, sort of, of course, the problem that we're living through in Iraq and Afghanistan. And America has draws on some interesting past adventures uh, in order to um, understand its current predicament. And I think some of the things I want to say have a bearing on that predicament. But uh, in our present circumstances, because globalization has proceeded uh, in the recent times without empire, uh, it means that um, we find it often very difficult to react when we are threatened by groups who resent our influence. And I'm talking now um, on behalf of America. The influence of America is resented in every part of the world where America has tried to do some good. And um, even uh, perhaps less resented in those parts of the world where it tried to do some harm. This is a, and this is a very important feature of the human condition that people on the whole are more ready to resent those who help them than those who, who um, hinder them. Uh, and uh, the question is, what do you do about it if you have no imperial presence? The, the groups that th currently threaten uh, uh, American, um, uh, the American uh, hegemony over the uh, world are not themselves nation states, but uh, often uh, groups uh, that are transnational, global in their own identity, and difficult to pin down and impossible to confront in any serious military way. Well, so how do we understand this situation? I think, first of all, we have to uh, have some grasp of the psychology of resentment. And I think uh, this is an important question that all Americans, again, are asking themselves. Why, why does everybody hate America? Would they hate America if America was as unsuccessful as Argentina, for instance? And the answer is no. Uh, of course they wouldn't. People only resent success. Uh, and they resent it without that success being necessarily to their own disadvantage. Um, and um, we also see that it's always the West that is to, to, to blame in, in, uh, in this state of mind. The West being identified with America as its principal uh, uh, most, and most successful member. Resentment comes on the whole from a, a zero-sum picture of the human condition. By that I mean the picture which says that if one person has a benefit, it must be at the cost of someone else. Uh, and you see this uh, zero-sum mentality in all kinds of political movements in um, the 20th century, not least in communism and Nazism. In communism, the idea, the fundamental idea, the ruling idea of the Marxist view is that the, the uh, advantages of one class are purchased at the cost of the disadvantages of another. And that feeds this uh, resentment and produces uh, and encourages a revolutionary situation in which those who feel disadvantaged feel also entitled to seize the assets of those who are not. Uh, and that, uh, this um, zero-sum way of looking at things seems to be absolutely deep in the human psychology. Uh, why that is, I don't know. Evolutionary psychologists have theories about this, um, but then they have theories about everything, and they, the theories tend, on the whole, to be simple, simply repetitions of the facts rather than explanations of them. But all I would say is that it seems to me, from the evidence of recent history, that we're never going to eradicate resentment. Uh, indeed, Nietzsche said that, uh, that resentment is the one permanent uh, social emotion. It's the one thing that will survive all, tra all changes. And um, uh, the question is, how do we deal with it? We can't eradicate it, but we must manage it. Uh, and uh, in my, my res uh, feeling about this is that the worst, res worst response to resentment is to concede the point to say, yes, you're right, my advantages are purchased at your cost, um, and, to, uh, and to grovel in, uh, uh, as a result of that. In my view, that um, if we look at the history of Nazism and communism, we will see that resentment is not appeased, but exacerbated by its own triumphs. 
Uh, and you see that in Russia today, the legacy of 70 years of this resentment which triumphed in 1917 uh, but continued to grow. So um, th those are just background thoughts as to how we should try to understand our situation now. Uh, we have ceased, in the, we in the West generally, have ceased to export empire. That is for certain. No, no Western power in the world today wants to have an empire uh, or would even um, think of how to set one up. But we have sought to export instead the nation state. This is something that uh, uh, we have been trying to uh, propagate around the world through the United Nations, through the, uh, the boundaries that we have um, largely drawn by Western powers in the wake of the two world wars. Uh, and um, it's after all France and uh, and England between them who created the boundaries of the so-called nation-states of the Middle East uh, and um, cr created them in a way which has suited their particular pursuit of power but didn't necessarily correspond to any natural feelings of the people residing there. And I think this is something that we all feel now in the wake of the, um, our experiences since, um, well, since re the, the creation of the State of Israel. Now, so uh, to, to understand our such situation, therefore, we ought to understand, ask ourselves just what is a nation state and what is it that holds it together and can it be exported, this idea, around the world? One uh, thought, uh, uh, and it's the starting point of most Western political philosophy, is that the nation state is simply founded on a social contract. It's something that, uh, uh, that we create through, cons through our mutual consent to submit to a, a central form of government. Uh, and this, um, uh, uh, this idea of government founded on consent is, I think, very dear to us. Uh, the question is, is that sufficient to, uh, to identify the kind of conception of the state that we uh, now enjoy? Well, um, the great problem, of course, is, is that uh, uh, although it is true that our countries are, our, our nation states are founded on some kind of uh, consensual process, uh, it isn't only consent that makes them what they are, and that consent is only given because they are something else. It's because they can call upon our loyalty. The idea of the social contract is, if you, those of you who study government will recall, is the idea of people gathered in a certain place who set about to form the terms of their relationship uh, to which they will agree uh, uh, and then be bound by those terms as under a contract. But the question is what, what uh, the first question to ask is what brought them together in that place uh, in order that they should make this decision? What, what is it that they have in common that enables them to think that they really can settle upon their destiny together? They must already believe that they belong uh, as a kind of first-person plural if this kind of consensual process is to begin. Uh, and likewise, uh, uh, the, the idea of citizenship that we have all inherited, where a citizen is somebody who is bound by some relation of, uh, of mutual consent to his fellow citizens, that too depends upon some prior sense that we belong together. Now in America, which is a highly mobile society, uh, this sense of belonging with each other is constantly being regenerated. Uh, in Europe, it, it has ha suffered, of course, from the uh, conflicts of the 20th century, but nevertheless, it is there as the background condition for the nation state. There can only be a nation state if there is a national loyalty. And I think that's the first thing that we have to understand. What, what is a national loyalty? Uh, how does it differ from the other loyalties that people are, are bound by? Uh, uh, you, obviously, people have loyalties to their religion, to their family, to their tribe, to their neighborhood. Uh, and those are uh, very important loyalties in people's lives, but they're not the loyalties that are called upon by the nation state. The nation state says, that there is another loyalty which as it uh, in a way transcends all those because it's the foundation of our political order and that's loyalty to the nation itself. Just what is that thing, the nation? Well, I think the first thing to, to uh, recognize about it is that a nation is a territory. 
and the a national loyalty is a kind of territorial loyalty, fe feeling that you belong in a certain place, uh, and um, your uh, and your way of life is determined by the customs that prevail in that place and by the law that is exerted over it, so that um, nation states have territorial jurisdictions. Right? They they are the law that governs them is defined over a certain territory and, uh, uh, and comes to uh, uh, um, loses its authority at the borders of that territory. Uh, uh, now that's very different of course from uh, a law which is founded upon religious uh, revelation like the, the Sharia of the Muslims which is uh, derived originally from the Quran through uh, uh, in, in conjunction with various procedures for, it, for elaborating and extending the precepts that can be discovered in the Quran. This is a, a religious law which has no reference to territory. It's addressed to all mankind, to the uh, Islamic Ummah, the, the complete community of Muslims, of those who've submitted. And this um, is a very different conception, therefore, uh, of, uh, uh, of law and, and, and a very different conception of legitimacy and there is a great question in everybody's mind as to whether the nation state can really be um, combined with that conception of legal order because the, the legal order has no reference to the nation or the territory which defines it. Uh, isn't there going to be some potential conflict there? And that's one of the questions I'd like to put before you to think about uh, and it, it may or may not be true but obviously there have been great difficulties in uh, generating uh, uh, an Islamic nation state. Pakistan was intended to be that, uh, but uh, has, um, uh, as you know, uh, just suffered endless crises ever since its foundation. Now, we might say that the nation is something that we in the West have retrieved from the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment which swept away the, the domination of religion in our lives left us with a a certain vacuum, a vacuum of loyalty. To what are we going to uh, refer in defining our shared loyalty and our shared allegiance if religion has been taken away or marginalized? Uh, and the answer seemed to be the nation. It seemed to arise spontaneously at the Enlightenment as the point to which people refer, can refer by way of defining what holds them together. Uh, but of course it's not, um, it wasn't really an invention of the Enlightenment. It was already contained, according to many commentators, within the Christian tradition, and the, uh, the Christian way of thinking, that the loyalty to the nation should be something defined independently of religious belief. Uh, this was something that um, was already uh, enunciated by Pope Gelasius I in the 6th century, that when he defined the two swords, as he called them, which had been given for the government of human communities meaning by that the sword of the, um, the spiritual sword of the, uh, uh, in the hands of the church which governs men's souls but the, and the secular sword in the hands of the emperor or king or sovereign which uh, governs the actual legal order under which people reside. That, that divorce between uh, religious and uh, spiritual discipline, uh, sorry, religious and, uh, and secular discipline is something which many commentators think is integral to the Christian vision of what a state should be. Uh, and without it, there isn't really genuine religious freedom. Right, so, um, just to give a few characteristics then of this national loyalty that we all depend upon. Now first, it's a loyalty to a place and a territory. Uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, um, symbolized in America, of course, by the American flag. Which, has as its, which is a symbol of this territory and the various states that compose it. Uh, and um, that is a very different way of defining loyalty than, by, than defining it in religious terms. When loyalty is to a place or a territory, it depends very much on ideas of neighborhood and neighborly, neighborliness being on the right terms with your neighbours, recognising that, that you share a space together and granting them freedom within that space. But of course it also depends upon a shared history and a shared culture and a shared language which are the natural products of uh, residing together in a, in a 
in a common territory. Uh, and many people would say that if there is a shared religion, this is a consequence of those things and not the foundation of those things. It's a consequence of people living together in a common territory uh, and swearing their primary allegiance to that territory uh, that they should also share a, a religion, and they might not. Indeed, uh, in uh, America, they don't, although, of course, Christianity is, is dominant here. And finally, the law of a nation state and the law that arises out of this form of loyalty is a secular law. It's one that, uh, that applies to people independently of their religious belief. It's the same law, whatever your belief, uh, your, your religious belief. Uh, and there's a great question of w as to how, to what extent that is possible and what, what conditions a religion must, must satisfy in order to be uh, a, 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 a possible religion within a nation state. But those conditions have um, set the stage for negotiated relations between nation states. Nation states uh, settle their disputes on the whole by referring to uh, law, by engaging in contractual dealings. And of course, if war breaks out, it ca tends to be extremely prolonged for that very reason. Uh, th there is always some, there is some deep difficulty rather than a fragile one. Uh, and I think what we have been seeing in the Muslim world today is an attempt to, um, the, the, uh, attempt to impose this idea of the nation state on the Muslim world and a kind of inherent resistance to it. Uh, and we see this, uh, for instance, in Turkey today. Turkey is perhaps the most successful example of a, an is Islamic nation state. But um, it's a, a state that was created by Ataturk expressly uh, as a secular state, and religion was forbidden, uh, was driven out of public life, Islamic dress was forbidden, all kinds of uh, uh, natural Islamic expressions were removed completely from the apparatus of the state, and the, and the law was declared to be secular. Now, of course, uh, as Islam is creeping back, because um, inevitably people need a religion, uh, we're finding a great tension arising in Turkey, Today, there is a, a so-called terrorist trial in which uh, some of the most important and distinguished people in the country are being uh, accused before a court of law of organizing terrorism because um, they were thought to belong to um, a, a, an, a, an active wing of the uh, Turkish establishment which wants to maintain this secular constitution <coughs> and um, uh, against the creeping Islamization of the country. Uh, and today also in Afghanistan we see um, another example of the difficulty which, which um, Muslims have in accepting a nation state uh, as a secular jurisdiction. Somebody, uh, a, a young man, downloaded some material about the emancipation of women in, uh, uh, under Islamic uh, law onto his computer and this was held to be blasphemous by a court, a Sharia court in, Af in rural Afghanistan, and he was sentenced to death. Uh, his, his sentence was commuted to 20 years in prison, but uh, still, for most of us, w we would think this is extraordinary that there should be uh, such a, that such a thing should be a crime, uh, and, and certainly extraordinary that it should be um, uh, endorsed by the state. Uh, we, we would certainly uh, uh, recognize the validity of, uh, of um, the clergy condemning some private act as blasphemy and saying it shouldn't be done, but for the state to uphold that condemnation uh, is um, for us a violation of one of the basic principles uh, of um, a national jurisdiction. Right, now, um, all this I think ha has bearing on the um, terrorist problem that we are uh, living through. The old forms of terrorism uh, uh, with which I grew up, although uh, I've never been an explicit member of a terrorist organization, um, <laughs> they were all uh, largely in pursuit of national identities. They were part of the whole national uh, nation-state idea uh, in which nations trapped within, uh, within uh, nation-states but, but unable to regard them as legitimate were trying to to carve out a territory for themselves. This is what we, we find in, um, obviously, in the IRA, the Irish terrorists, 
the ETA movement in the Basque country and so on, the, the old terrorist movements in, in Western Europe at least. This perhaps isn't so true of the Russian terrorists who actually first um, uh, produced the, the real mayhem, uh, the, the ones who are described by Dostoevsky and Joseph Conrad, but um, those are very, are very much a Russian phenomenon. But the old terrorists that we knew in Europe were certainly part of the, uh, the na nation-state idea who just felt, felt that they, they needed a nation of their own and their only way to get it was to declare internal war on the nation-state which included them. But now we confront a terrorism which is based on a rejection of the national idea. I think this is the most important feature of it. Uh, it doesn't recognize the legitimacy of national borders, nor does it want uh, uh, to create a nation-state of its own. Its cause is a global cause, um, and the, the, co the cause of Islamization, uh, and it's precipitated precisely by the tendency of trade, and the, trade uh, the globalization of trade, to globalize people's self-understanding. Those people who are... Uh, as it were, in uh, feeling their resentment of the Western dominance of the global order, uh, wish to respond to it in global ways. They don't wish uh, to um, establish for themselves a nation state of their own. They wish rather to oppose one global presence with another. Uh, and this, I think, is what we must understand about Al-Qaeda. The, the name means the base, uh, um, but it's a, bla a base in cyberspace. There isn't a place where it is, nor is there a place where it particularly wants to be as a, as a, a political entity. It's a base outside the, the current global order, to, and it takes as its enemy Satan himself, embodied now in this nation state, now in that nation state, and America, of course, in, uh, always in the foreground. It doesn't have clear political goals other than destruction. Uh, uh, the destruction of the existing order, global order, and the dominance of America within it. Uh, and this is something which um, uh, makes it very difficult to deal with. There's nothing that can be offered to Al-Qaeda by way of buying it off. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to know how to include it in any negotiated settlement for the future of the global order. It's not, um, it's not in that game at all. Uh, uh, and so what do we do and how do we respond? To respond in a military way is also seems to be irrelevant. Any actual target turns out not to be Al-Qaeda, but a, a nation state or a group within a nation state which uh, is only vaguely linked to this uh, abstract and purely con conceptual uh, entity. So how do we respond to this? I want to just to conclude by, by saying something about the problems of responding to this, uh, this kind of terrorism, and something about what we should hang on to by way of identifying and fortifying our own um, conviction in the matter. Some of the problems are, are, are these. First, uh, that, uh, there is a lack of, a, of um, corporate identity in Islamic institutions. We in the West, because of our long tradition of citizenship, are used to the idea that one person can speak for a collective. In a firm, the chief executive speaks for the whole firm. Uh, in, in a parliament, the speaker of parliament speaks for the whole parliament. In a state, the president speaks for the whole state, and so on. And in all our communities, you will find this idea uh, uh, emerging of a corporate identity in which one, one person can speak with authority for the whole of the community, as, a, as the president of this university could speak for the university. And his, what he says will be taken as binding on those whom he represents. And that tradition of representation uh, and um, spokesmanship is something which, to a great extent, has not emerged in Islam, and this is, a lot of people have, have written about this, uh, has something to do with the structure of Islamic law, which doesn't seem to acknowledge the idea of the corporate person. Uh, so it does mean that we, well, there's a great difficulty in knowing who you should be speaking to if you're confronted by uh, a global 
form uh, of radical Islam. Who is representing it? Somebody might step forward to represent it, as Ayatollah Khomeini did at a certain stage, but as soon as you start discussing with him, you discover that he only represents a faction, and no sooner has he made a decision than those on the behalf of whom he's made that decision deny it and say, he was speaking for himself, but not for me. Because there is the institutional structure which enables people to speak for others is lacking. This, of course, in the Christian churches, this is, um, things go in a very different way. Uh, uh, the Catholic Church obviously has a very strong hierarchical structure. Uh, my own church, the Anglican, um, does have an archbishop, but it, uh, I, you know, it was founded, the Anglican Church, before the discovery of America, and that great mistake has obviously now ruined the Anglican Church too. But nevertheless, the idea that there is somebody at the top of it who could speak for it is a, is a real one. That's what, uh, uh, one point to remember. And, and secondly, the, the, the Western secular state, and this is connected, is a kind of procedure for forming collectives. Uh, the Western secular state is founded on the idea of representation, that uh, we're constantly f coming together in groups, appointing spokesmen, negotiating through that spokesman, spokesperson, uh, and coming to c decisions that are binding on us all. That's the way we solve our problems. Uh, and that's really what people have in mind when they refer to a social contract that pr procedure of solving problems by representation. And that's fundamental to the idea of citizenship. Uh, and, um, of course, citizenship in this respect can be contrasted with the um, thing that is always being called for by Muslim extremists, which is brotherhood, ikhwan in Arabic. The, the idea that you... Um, the real unity between people is not one that is negotiated through representation. It's not one which involves compromises, concessions, half-heartedness, and all the things that we admire. It's something which is a, a, a totally organic, integrated unity of the kind that exists in a family. And that's something which uh, we don't seek and don't want in the West, but it's something that many people do seek and do want. Uh, so we need to hold on, uh, this, is, this is the positive part of what I w want to say, we need to hold on to what we deeply are in this, con in this conflict. And what is it that we deeply are? I'm using the word we, a first person plural, to embrace all the people in this room uh, and uh, uh, recognising that, that they come from very different backgrounds. People who enjoy the Western way of life and the kind of citizenship that the nation state provides us with don't have a, a religion in common, although they have a Christian inheritance in common. They include Jews, agnostics, atheists, and so on, and even Muslims if they uh, permit it. Uh, but do, uh, they may not permit it, of course, but in, in Europe we're having to face this problem. To what extent are the Muslim minorities really prepared to offer their loyalty to the nation state? To do that is to recognize that the nation state takes precedence over your religious duty when there's any conflict between them. That's something that Christians and Jews have got used to, uh, but uh, Muslims find difficult to get used to for very understandable reasons. Right, so the, uh, the question is, what, what is it then that does bind us together? Uh, and I, I just want to say a little bit about, um, uh, about uh, uh, two concepts which I think are very important to us. The, the first is the concept of forgiveness. Um, we have a, a remedy that we've inherited for the, uh, for the problem of resentment resentment whether we find it in ourselves or whether we encounter it in others. And that is the remedy that was taught by Christ uh, and became embodied in many of our secular institutions and our secular jurisdictions, which is the remedy of forgiveness. Uh, and, uh, of course, we have the supreme example of Christ's forgiveness on the cross of those who were tormenting him. But we are all commanded to do likewise, that in the, in the in any conflict, first of all, to try that, try forgiveness. Even if you're up against hatred, see what it is that the other person is saying, acknowledge his status as an equal, uh, and uh, 
uh, and do what you can to forgive him for what he does. Now, this is not something which is, uh, I think, easily obeyed, this imperative, but it has been installed in many ways in our day-to-day -day conduct and in the procedures that we all follow in any conflict. We concede the point, first of all. We recognize the other's right to exist, and we do this um, because we can distance ourselves sufficiently to see the whole situation from outside. And that, I think, brings me to the other major attribute that we that are in our inheritance, which I think we must hold on to, which is the attribute of irony. Um, now, most of, uh, uh, of readers of the Quran would recognize that, unlike the Hebrew Bible, and certainly unlike the New Testament, it is an irony-free zone. Uh, and uh, that the, the things are said literally, we're given literal instructions in a, a very elevated, often beautiful language which we are to obey. But there is, by contrast, there's a developing streak of irony in the Hebrew Bible, and one that is amplified by the Talmud. But a new kind of irony dominates Christ's judgments and parables in the New Testament. Which, and these judgments and parables look on the spectacle of human folly and wryly show us how to live with it. A, a telling example of this, which is very relevant to us today, is Christ's verdict in the case of the woman taken in adultery. Remember, let he who is without fault cast the first stone. In other words, come off it. Haven't you wanted to do what she did and already done it in your hearts? Um, is, now, people have suggested that this story is a, a later insertion into the Gospels, one of the many culled by the early Christians from the store of inherited wisdom attributed after his death to the Redeemer. But even if that is true, it merely confirms the view that the Christian religion has made irony central to its message. Um, now, irony was seen by the late Richard Rorty, who is a philosopher whom many of you might have come across, uh, as a state of mind intimately connected with the postmodern worldview. It's, he thought of it as a, a withdrawal, a withdrawal from, from judgment, but nevertheless aims at a kind of consensus, a shared agreement not to judge. But I don't think that is what Christ was getting at. Uh, uh, and it seems to me that irony, although it infects our states of mind, is better understood as a virtue. It's a disposition aimed at a kind of practical fulfillment and moral success. And if I were to venture a definition of this virtue, I would describe it thus, as the, the habit of acknowledging the otherness of everything, including oneself. However convinced you are of the rightness of your actions and the truth of your views, look on them as the actions and the views of someone else and rephrase them accordingly. So defined, irony is quite distinct from sarcasm. It's a mode of acceptance rather than rejection. Uh, and it points both ways. Through irony, I learn to accept both the other on whom I turn my gaze and also myself, the one who is gazing. Irony isn't free from judgment. It simply recognizes that the one who judges is also judged and judged by himself. Now, I think that our democratic inheritance stems from, in part from the habit of forgiveness. To forgive the other person is to accept his otherness and to, regard, uh, and to grant him in your heart the freedom to be. It's to acknowledge, therefore, the free individual as sovereign over his life and free to do both right and wrong. A society which makes permanent room for forgiveness therefore tends in a democratic direction, since it is a society in which the voice of the other is heard in all decisions that affect him. Now, it seems to me therefore that forgiveness and irony lie at the heart of our civilization, and they are what we most have to be proud of, and they are pr our principal means to disarm our internal enemies. Uh, they underlie our conception of citizenship as founded in consent, and they are expressed in our conception of law as a means to resolve conflicts by discovering the just solution to them. And um, God's commandments are important, of course, in setting limits to what we citizens of Western 
democracies can do or discover, but our law itself results from the human attempt to resolve our own conflicts for ourselves by treating each party to them as a responsible individual acting freely uh, for, for himself. Now many people <coughs> believe that the threat under which we find ourselves today, the threat issuing from the Islamists, has been exaggerated and that the reaction to 9-11 was both excessive and unguided by any real sense of what could be achieved. And some have gone further and questioned the whole strategy of the American leadership, and I think many people in America feel this. To use war as an instrument of policy, they argue, is a prolonged provocation, calculated to produce precisely the opposite of the goal intended. <coughs> and there may be truth in that. But I don't think this allows us to discount the threat. Al-Qaeda may be weak, the whole conspiracy to destroy the West may be little more than a fiction in the brains of the neoconservatives, who are themselves maybe a fiction in the brains of liberals. But <laughs> the threat doesn't come from a conspiracy or from an organization. It comes from individuals undergoing a traumatic experience that we don't fully understand. The experience of a deraciné Muslim confronting the modern world without the benefit of uh, irony uh, and without any acceptance of the conditions that are laid down by the nation state. Such a person is an unpredictable byproduct of unforeseen and uncomprehended circumstances, and our best efforts to understand his motives have so far suggested no policy that would deter his attacks. So what should be our stance in this existential confrontation? It seems to me to be right to emphasize the very great virtues and achievements that we have built on our legacy of toleration and show a willingness to criticize and amend all the vices to which it has also given undue space. I think, personally, we should accept the legitimate criticisms that Muslims make of our decadent and licentious approach to sex, marriage, and the family, and that we should make those criticisms our own. We should resurrect Locke's distinction between liberty and license and make it absolutely clear to our children that liberty is a form of order, not a license to anarchy and self-indulgence. Uh, and we should cease to mock the things that have mattered to our parents and grandparents and be proud of what they achieved. And that is not arrogance, but a just recognition of our privileges. Uh, my own f f feeling is that we should also move away from the multicultural vision that has so confused public life in the West uh, and reaffirm firm the core idea of social membership in the Western tradition, which is the idea of citizenship. And by sending out the message that we believe in what we have, are prepared to share it but not prepared to see it destroyed, we do, I think, the only thing that we can do to confront and defuse the current conflict. Uh, and because forgiveness is at the heart of our culture, this message ought to be enough, even if we proclaim it in a spirit of irony. Thank you. <laughs>